Hey everybody, Mark Fox here with Amazing Prophecies YouTube channel, Forever Free Ministries. Jesus has repeatedly warned us that in the end times, almost everyone will end up committing the unpardonable sin. The Apostle Paul warned us to not quench the Spirit of God. There are so many voices that are beckoning for your attention, and in these last days, we must learn to recognize God's voice if we want to be saved. In this video, you will discover 10 ways to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. You will discover how to hear God's voice speaking to your heart in these last days. If you think you can handle the truth, stay tuned. Before we get into my provocative message, I want to get into your hands a free ebook called Mark of the Beast. Click on the link below. It's an ebook. You can also give a donation that's greatly appreciated but not required. Also, we want to get into your hands a book entitled Great Controversy. This powerful book covers topics like the mark of the beast, the seal of God, the Antichrist, the second coming of Christ, the dark ages, the destruction of Jerusalem. This large edition is $60 donation, you get one book. $240, six books. $420, 12 books. This book is packed with hundreds of colorful graphics and charts. You can donate by phone or you can donate by mail and we'll get these books to you. They're very powerful. Also, if you need help to find a Seventh-day Sabbath keeping church near you, text us at 972-268-4555. Give us your name and city or you can email us from around the world at amazingprophecies at gmail.com. Now let's get right into my message. Tonight's topic is about the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin, and how to hear God's voice speaking to your heart. The Baritime Shipping Company, the Baritime Shipping Company had an ad that they put in the newspaper in the classified section for a telegraph operator years and years ago, a telegraph operator. And the interview was scheduled for a Sunday morning. And so as the people filtered into the, uh, into the uh, waiting room, uh, they just busied themselves in looking at the newspaper and talking among themselves. And one by one, people came into this uh, waiting room waiting to see if they would get the job to be a telegraph key operator. There was some clattering of noise in the background and nobody really paid attention to it. And then all of a sudden, a person just stood up and made a beeline as if he was trying to beat everybody else, made a beeline for the office door. He opened the office door, nobody opened it for him, opened the office door and, and everybody is like, what? And a, a little while later, here comes that man, along with a company official. And the company official says, gentlemen, the job has been taken. Good day. And they said, whoa, wait a minute. You didn't, get, you didn't interview any of us. They get, Guys, calm down, calm down. I sent a message over the telegraph keys. I sent a message, and you all could hear it. And the message was, the first person to come through this door has the job. Good day, everybody. <laughs> that noise was a message. If you want the job, come in this door right now. God is speaking to us. And with some, it's just noise. With others who are in tune with the Holy Spirit, hear the voice of the Master the voice of the shepherd, the voice of our Savior calling us. I think about a boy who was playing at his, at, uh, his uh, grandfather's house and they had um, an ice plant and they would apparently sell ice. And there among the ice, they had a lot of sawdust and a boy was playing in there. Don't know why he was in there, but he was in there playing. And he lost 
his, his prized possession, his grandfather's pocket watch that was given to him. He treasured it. He valued it. He loved it, but he lost it. And he lost it amidst all of the sawdust there at the ice plant, and he wondered, what in the world am I going to do? And he looked and looked and looked frantically, and he couldn't find it. And then he got an idea. Maybe if I'm really, really quiet, and sure enough, tick, 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 he was able to hear his grandfather's pocket watch ticking away, and he was able to retrieve it. Have you lost something? Are you listening? Are you listening to the faintest whisper of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's voice is like the breeze among the leaves in the autumn. Can you hear? How, how many of you have ever gone to a forest and you're in the forest and you close your eyes and you're really still and you see all the different things that you can hear? The birds, the leaves, different things. Maybe a plane going overhead, especially if you're in Dallas-Fort Worth area, you know what you're going to hear. But have you ever paused to say, Lord, what are you saying to me? I do believe that at any time in every day, you can pause at any time of the day and you can say, Lord, help me to hear what you're saying to me. And at any juncture in the day, at any point in the day, you can do that and you can know that God is speaking to your heart. God is always speaking to us. The problem is we're not listening like we should. Now, you might be putting forth effort to listen, but I bet you can listen better. How many besides Mark Fox can say, Lord, help me to be a better listener to you? Amen? And so that's what my message is about. But I'm giving it in the context of the unforgivable, unpardonable sin. Well, what does the Bible say? Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 31 to 32. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the what? Spirit. The Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Is this serious business? This is a very strong warning. God forgives all sin. Is murder the unpardonable sin? No. Moses and David committed murder and they were forgiven. What about, what about just cursing God or something like that? Plenty of people have done that and they've repented. That was not the unpardonable sin. What about adultery like David committed and so forth? No. He was forgiven. We could go through a whole litany of sins. So what is the unforgivable, unpardonable sin? This is very, very important. Number one, in the time of Christ, they were saying, the opponents of Christ, the resistors were saying, this is very important, they were saying that Jesus was full of devils. Did you ever read that in the Bible? They said he was he was doing it by Beelzebub. So they were accusing Jesus of being led by the devil and of the devil. And in that context, Jesus had been warning them, if you continue to have that position, you're going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit and you will not be forgiven for that. In other words, if you look at what God is doing and you say that's of the devil and you just stay with that, you're resisting God, right? That's dangerous business. We got to be careful that we listen to the right voice. And then secondly, about the sin that God will not forgive, the sin that God will not forgive is also the sin that you refuse to give up. Amen. The sin that you and I say, no, I'm not going to give it up, then that becomes a sin that's not forgiven. Because if we confess our sins, there's the if. If we, forget, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The if means 
that if you want to make sure you don't commit the unpardonable sin, you need to make sure that you confess your sins and you don't worry about it. But the Bible makes it very clear that before the second coming of Christ, something is happening to people. They are searing, burning their conscience. They're tuning out the Holy Spirit. I remember the day growing up playing the radio. And I would notice as I would play, the, the, play around with the dial, sometimes if you went just a little bit to the left, you're into another station. You go a little bit to the right, you're out of that station, you're into another station. How many have ever discovered on the dial, if you want to get it into your channel, depending on how many competing stations are on, you have to really set that dial just right in order to lock in on your radio station you want to listen to. We have to lock in to the Holy Spirit. Because in the last days, the Bible makes it very clear that people would be tuning out the Holy Spirit, resisting the Holy Spirit. And here is what Paul said. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, he said in verses 19, 20, 21, he says, quench not the Spirit. Don't put the fire of the Holy Spirit out. Would you agree Jesus wants to baptize us with fire and the Holy Spirit? Don't put it out. Amen? How many want to be on fire for the Lord and not put the fire out? Amen? So this is very significant. In these last days, this whole generation is on the path that leads to the unpartable sin. Now that's significant. That's a mouthful. Because in the time of Noah, a whole generation went to the point of no return. Everyone committed the unforgivable sin, the sin that they would not repent of. And the whole world was destroyed, and it's going to happen again, but this time by the fire return of Jesus Christ. We go to the screen. Paul said, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What is the word grieve there? It means wound or, or to push away the Holy Spirit. Don't let your guardian angel leave you. Don't let your guardian angel leave you. You know, you can resist the Holy Spirit and you can resist the help of the holy angels. How many agree? Let's not give our guardian angel a tough time. Let's be submissive to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And allow the Holy Spirit and the holy angels. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit and the holy angels and the holy word of God are all in our favor to help us? Amen. Amen. And so don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Be sensitive to the faintest whisper of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is significant. How would you know if Jesus left you? Is it possible, is it possible to be going through the motions, religious motions, coming to church, carrying a Bible, whatever, giving your tithes and offerings, whatever, but you are detached from Jesus. My Bible tells me that in the last days, the Laodicean church thinks she's all right, but she's lukewarm and will be spit out of the mouth of Jesus unless she is revived. But how many are thankful we can be revived? We can be born again. We can be reformed. But in the last days, the whole world is going to commit the unpardonable sin. Now that's very, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So the, my concern is not that someone here has committed the unpardonable sin. My concern here is to make sure that none of us are on the path that will lead to the point of no return. To make sure we're not even on the path. We're not even taking one step toward the unpardonable sin. Is this making sense? In other words, let's get on the right path. Let's not get on the broad path that leads to destruction, but the narrow path that leads to the pearly gates, that leads to heaven. Get on that narrow passageway that leads upward, upward. And I believe that path becomes more narrow as we come close to the coming of Jesus Christ. And so in the days of Stephen, Stephen became the first Christian martyr. Did you know that? And here's what he preached. He said, listen to his bold preaching. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the 
Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. And they stoned him right then and there. They stoned him. They interrupted his sermon. They didn't want to hear it. They closed their ears. They were resisting, resisting, resisting the Holy Spirit. That's why Stephen says you always are doing this just like your fathers did. In other words, they wouldn't break from the from the sins of their fathers and the sins of their great-grandfathers, etc. So the Bible says this is what's going to happen in the last days. People are going to be stiff-necked. What does it mean to be stiff-necked? Have you ever seen a child? Have you ever seen a child disobey mommy or daddy and the body language? What's the body language? They stiffen the neck. I don't know. It's a phenomenon. I don't fully understand. But why stiffen the neck? Is that going to help you? Stiff the neck. That's good. Is that going to really resist mommy's uh, spankings? Or? <laughs> but there it is. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. In other words, tuning out the Holy Spirit, resisting the Holy Spirit. We want to be careful that we do not resist the Holy Spirit for one moment in the day. We have to resist either the devil, James 4, 7, or the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 7. I want to only resist the devil. Amen? Amen. Only resist the devil. Jesus always has the last word, but Satan is always up to mischief. Every single day, the devil will try to give you a hard time. I say resist the devil and he will flee in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Always in the name of Jesus. You can't resist the devil. You and I have no strength. We can only resist the devil in the name of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we keep going. In the days of Noah, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Genesis 6, verse 3. And so they were in the days of Noah, that's how it would be in our day. Jesus said as it was in the days of Noah, it would be just like that in the last days. What was it like in the days of Noah? What were they doing? Resisting, resisting the what? The Spirit of God. And then came the flood. There's a striking parallel to our day. Our day is a preoccupied generation resisting, resisting, resisting the Holy Spirit. Do you think that most people are even interested in pausing to listen to God? No, no, no. What are people doing tonight? Oh, they've got their plans, plans of entertainment. In America, we are saturated with entertainment. Hollywood, Hollywood movies and so forth. And then, of course, hip hop music, and rap music and on and on and on, rock and roll music and, and just so many different channels to watch. People are preoccupied. They're not listening to God. And so listen to what it, Jesus quoted Isaiah. And in the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Thine ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand uh, with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. That lamentable prophecy is happening in our day as well. I say this, let's learn to listen to a still small voice. It takes some learning, but a child can do it. Samuel, as a boy, learn to listen to the voice of God. How about that? And it was a small, it was a very tender voice and so forth. And uh, learn to listen to his still small voice. Many people wonder, does God actually talk to people? Does he really give them personal guidance as to how they should live? What decisions they ought to make? What direction their life should go? In a world of absolute confusion, impenetrable moral darkness, soul-numbing apathy and unbelief, God is speaking to those who will what? Those who will listen. 
And so to this last preoccupied generation before the second coming of Jesus, the Lord himself is seeking to get our undivided attention. Amidst the chaos and confusion in our troubled world, God has special messages for each one of us every single day of our lives. I repeat, every single day of every hour of the day, God is speaking to us. Now you just think about the implications of that. You can never say, I'm bored. Bored, don't you dare say that as a Christian. Because as a Christian, if you're waiting in the waiting room, you're in communion with God. And there's nothing boring about prayer. Can you say amen? amen. By the way, my wife and I were discussing this in the car the other day. One of the number one ways you can show your love for somebody is to pray for them. So never say you're bored. Instead, start praying for your loved ones. Amen? Amen. So I believe with all my heart that God is speaking to you these last several weeks in a very personal way, and I believe it'll end up helping you to hear his loving, longing voice like never before. Listen to what it says in Revelation 3.22. He who has an ear, use it. That's what Jesus is saying. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Does God speak to the church? Yes, he does. And we are part of the church. Now, during the time of ancient Israel, God spoke directly to a man by the name of Moses from a burning bush and told him what to say to the Pharaoh of Egypt. And then after God poured out the 10 plagues upon Egypt and miraculously delivered the children of Israel from the Egyptian army by parting the Red Sea, he then spoke in an awesome thunderous voice on Mount Sinai as he spoke and wrote the what? The 10 commandments. Would you agree that was clear communication from God? causing everyone in the camp of Israel to tremble in fear at the mighty voice of God. Can you imagine being part of that Israeli encampment? Can you imagine being part of the children of Israel at that time when the whole mountain shook? Let me tell you, that must have felt very intimidating, very fearful. And so then, years later, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by a son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Very, very significant that God would speak directly to us from Jesus. Think about it. How serious is God to talk to us? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come down here to talk to us in person. Would you agree? What more could he possibly do? Amen? That Jesus, the Son of God, would come down here to speak to mankind and that we would have a record of much of it. Not all of it, because John said there's just too much material there to, to cover. And so this is very, very powerful that God would send his Son to do what? to speak to us. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet. They stoned them, they killed them, they maligned them. And then here comes Jesus himself. Jesus himself. Praise God. And then what did Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice and follow me. John 10, 27. Revelation 3, 20. Read it together with me. Here we go. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Is it clear that Jesus Christ is still with us, but now through his Holy Spirit, and he's still speaking to us as though we could literally see him? Do you believe that? Right now it's by faith, but very soon face to face. Praise God for that. So I want you to notice my sheep hear my voice. So God's sheep are known for their listening habits. They're known how? How are, how are God's sheep described here? They listen good. They're listening. And so behold, they stand at the door and knock if any man hears my voice. So Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, I'm talking to you. 
Now, what does it mean? What does it mean here? Behold, they stand at the door and knock. What does that mean? Knock. How does he knock? When you feel your need, he's knocking. When you feel a desire to seek God, that's God knocking. When you feel a conviction of sin, that's Jesus knocking. When you long for the presence of Jesus, that's Jesus knocking. Jesus is knocking on our heart. He's knocking on the door. Now let me ask you this. If Jesus literally came to your house and he literally knocked on the door and you knew it was Jesus, would you say, Jesus, come on in? What would you say if you really knew it was Jesus at your door? Or would you say, Lord, uh, come back in an hour after I change some habits? And <laughs> I say, welcome Jesus, just as you are. And say, Jesus, I'm glad you came. I need your help to make changes in my life. Amen. Amen. And so let's keep going. So let's go through some of the ways that God speaks to us, and we've already covered a little bit of that, but I want to enumerate these for you, okay? Number one, God speaks to us through his written word. This is the most important and most reliable way in which we can know that, in fact, God is speaking to us. So many people will say, oh, I heard God speak to me, I heard God speak to me, but the strongest way God speaks to us is in the word of God. This is his voice. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, what everybody? It is because there is no light in them. We need to test it with the word of God, Isaiah 8, 20. Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. We needed to search the word of God to know what God has said. All scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profit profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Second Corinthians, uh, pardon me, Second Timothy 3.16. Notice that the word of God is for reproof and correction. How many love to be corrected? In our flesh, we don't like to be corrected, do we? We don't like to be corrected. But here, this word, God's word, is inspired to correct us. So that means I must have a teachable spirit to come in alignment with the word of God. It's profitable for reproof and for correction. So how many want to say, Jesus, I'm willing for you to correct me. Jesus, I'm willing for you to rebuke me. You see, and that's very, very, very important. Let's keep going. So sometimes, I just have to read this, sometimes people tell me that they wish God would speak to them directly where they could literally hear his audible voice. Yes, that would be great, but nevertheless, the good news is that God is speaking to us through the word of God, and as you read the Bible, God's word, remember that this is the voice of God to your soul and mind, just as surely as we would come, uh, could hear his voice. If we would believe this, it would revolutionize our Bible reading, our devotional life would take on a fresh new captivating interest, personal fulfillment, because believe that God is speaking to us as if we could hear his voice. God's word is recording his, of his voice, speaking through the inspired Bible writers. So as you open the sacred inspired pages of the Bible, humbly listen to God's word, ready to believe and obey his every word Jesus said. So I wanted to read that because I don't want you to miss that, not one little thought here. Listen to what Jesus says. He quoted Matthew 4.4. 4. Hey, um, pardon me, he quoted Deuteronomy 8 in Matthew 4.4. 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what, everybody? Every what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God has spoken. And so every time you read the word of God, always ask, what is Jesus saying to me? Let's say that together. What is Jesus saying to me? Again, what is Jesus saying to me? Very important. Then think of the personal application of his word, his promises, his commands to your personal life. I want to encourage you to have a devotional habit. In the morning, take an hour with God alone. 
If you take a half an hour, fine, take a half an hour. I recommend an hour. I recommend you, recommend you take your time. If Jesus literally came over to your house, you wouldn't tell him, okay, I got five minutes. If Jesus literally came over to your house, you would not be in a rush. You'd say, I, I don't care what, I, the, the, the roof can cave in, I'm taking my time with Jesus. If you could literally see him. Is that true, yes or no? All right? So, it's important to journal. Get out a journal and write the date at the top. And as you study the Bible, write down some of the things the Lord is revealing to you. Write down your prayers. Write down answers to prayer. I'm here to tell you, think of the personal application of what you're reading. Think about that. God is speaking to you that very moment. A matter of fact, the Lord just impressed me. Let's go to Isaiah 50 and verse 4. Holy Spirit just impressed me to go to this scripture. Isaiah 50. Oh, we're learning something. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learn. This is messianic. Jesus experienced this. And we can experience it as well. Every morning, God wakes us up to speak to us. Do you want to hear his voice? Yes or no? So the word of God is his voice, as though we could actually hear his voice. Number two, God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. The Bible gives us examples of people who were given direct instruction through the Holy Spirit so far, so far as their duty to God was concerned. For example, in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, we find how Philip the evangelist was told by angels, as well as the Holy Spirit, to go to a certain place where he would meet an official of the Ethiopian government and where he would have the chance to share the gospel with this man. It's all recorded in Acts 8. When the chariot this official was riding came close, the Holy Spirit told Philip, quote, go near and overtake the chariot. Go near and overtake this chariot. After Philip explained how a passage from the book of Isaiah was referring to Jesus and his mission as the Messiah, the Ethiopian official asked to be baptized as a Christian. When this took place, the Bible tells us that, quote, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. <laughs> I would love to have seen that. See him giving a Bible study and then, I, whoa, that must have been pretty amazing. You know, don't limit the Holy Spirit, right? Caught him away. I'm gonna, I, I want to know what was that like, Philip, to be caught away like that. That must have been very memorable for sure. But the point is, the Holy Spirit was leading Philip, the evangelist. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. Now, I want you to think about this. How many have a bed? I know you have a bed. Come on. How many have a bed? Not a trick question. All right. You have a bed. How many lay down on your bed? All right. Do you know that you're going to spend about one third of your life on your bed? So get a good bed. Get a good pillow. And change your pillow once in a while. <laughs> Now, I want you to think about this. One third of your life, you need about seven to eight hours of sleep each night. That, how many hours in a day? 24. So one third of your life is going to be on your bed. Is it possible to develop a very good sleeping routine, a routine at your bed that is actually conducive and compatible and a good catalyst to have a close walk with Jesus. Listen to this scripture, Psalms 4.4. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. What in the world? Are you serious? On your bed. Don't just focus on, okay, I'm getting in my bed and I'm going to go to sleep. It's okay, you're going to go to sleep, but first, Meditate a little bit. Meditate on the Lord. Think about the Word of God. Think about what Jesus is saying to you. Some of the most memorable times I've had with the Lord has been on my bed. 
as I've listened to the Lord speaking to my heart before going to sleep. Our last thoughts should be of Jesus as we're going to sleep. Our first thoughts in the morning should be of Jesus Christ. How many believe Jesus is worthy of our meditation? Amen? And so when you're on your bed, are you interested in getting a good night's sleep? Yes or no? Then think about Jesus. And like my mother tells me, you know, just rest in Jesus because he'll be up all night anyway. <laughs> the Bible says in Psalms 121 that the Lord does not slumber. He's watching over you at night. Sometimes, how many ever struggle to go to sleep at times or struggle to stay asleep? Raise your hand if you ever have a restless sleep once in a while. Raise your hand if you ever have a restless sleep besides Mark Fox once in a while. I think that's probably about 90% of us. The others are lying, but anyway. <laughs> but so my point is this, is that why not learn, why not learn a good spiritual routine on your bed? Have a good tradition between you and the Lord that when you get in your bed, you meditate on maybe one of the Psalms. You talk to the Lord about something. And by all means, make sure that you've confessed any sins that come to your mind. So when you go to bed, you're not going to bed guilty. How many, you know, the point is, you, you don't know if you're going to make it through the night. Many people die in their sleep, right? So my point is, always be right with God. Amen? Be right with God as you go to sleep. And then in your, when you get up in the morning, think, don't be thinking of 15 things you have to get done. Just pause for a moment and just say, Lord, please come into my heart, Jesus. Please protect me, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Start the day immediately, even before you get out of bed. Start the day. I, I just, I linger on this because I have learned over the years that on the bed, is probably the most still you'll ever be during the day. Am I right about that? That's about the, the most still you're ever going to be in the whole day. So take advantage of that time when you're really still, you're really quiet, and you can really think one thing at a time. Right? And so if you are troubled with sleep, why not give all your troubled thoughts to the Lord, and I bet you'll sleep better. Amen? Amen? Number three, God speaks to us through our conscience. The book of Isaiah tells that is we are true follower of God. If we're a true follower of God, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, whether you turn to the right hand or whether you turn to the left. Isaiah 30 and verse 21. God gives us our conscience. But in the last days, what's happening? Before Jesus Christ comes again, what's happening to people? What's beginning to happen to people? More and more people are burning their conscience. They're searing their conscience so that their conscience, like a moral compass, is not working right. It's broken down. Now this is a very scary thing to tell you the truth that your conscience can be so perverted that you've messed it up, you're not even listening to your conscience, your conscience needs to be enlightened. Now I am thankful that God is in the repairing business because we've all sinned, who besides myself in the past has ever sinned willfully, deliberately? That's searing the conscience, those deliberate sins really mess with the conscience and so forth. But I'm thankful that Hosea 14 verse four says, God heals backsliding. Hallelujah, you can have your conscience revived. Is that good news or what? And so that's, um, that's Isaiah 30, verse 21. So the point is, the conscience is like a moral compass, like a moral GPS saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you go to the left or when you go to the right and so forth. And so it's important that we be in tune with God and that we can recognize the voice of God conscience. All right? And so let's just keep going here. So in John 8 verse 9, we read that on one occasion, those whose sins Jesus wrote in the dirt were, quote, 
convicted by their conscience. God was speaking to their conscience that they were guilty of unconfessed sins, and if their conscience ever seems to be troubled, it may mean that God is speaking to your heart that you need to confess your sins to Him and then believe that He forgives you for the sake of Christ, His Son. Do you know what it says in Hebrews? It talks about having a conscience that's cleansed uh, more purged by the blood of Jesus Christ, sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful that the Lord can go in there and cleanse our conscience and cleanse our mind? Isn't it wonderful that God can clean us up? Isn't that good news? And so, number four, God speaks through his providential leading and events and circumstances of our life. Sometimes God sets up circumstances which will cause certain doors to open and others to close on our journey of life. God opens doors and God closes doors. Amen? If he closes one door, he's opening another door. I even say God closes a door and he opens a window. I mean, whatever God wants to do. Amen? And so... I think about, the Bible tells us the experience of a false prophet by the name of Balaam, whose donkey could see an angel with a sword drawn in his hand, and which therefore turned off the pathway that Balaam wanted to follow, so he could curse the children of Israel and gain a rich reward for the king of Moab. It's all recorded in Numbers 22. And so, what happened? Was that angel, was there with a sword... To close, would you agree, if you have an angel with a sword in front of you, I think that's a closed door. Huh? That's a closed door. But Balaam doesn't see it. The donkey sees it. Oh my, what a commentary is that. What a commentary is that. And then the donkey spoke to him like, why are you beating me like this? I think that's a closed door. And Balaam instead is now arguing, trying to argue with the donkey. The man was mad. Let me tell you something. Sin is ugly. And rebellion is the ugliest thing of sin. Balaam was wanting to rebel against God. He was wanting to get the rich reward. He's wanting to go and curse Israel and so forth. And so he's, he's here <laughs> arguing with the donkey until he realized, wow, the angel with a sword drawn Wow, wow, wow. God had closed the door. Now, God is not always that dramatic when he closes doors. But God let God close doors. I want to say this to the young people. If you have a boyfriend or you have a girlfriend, if God wants to close the door, let him close the door. Man, it got real quiet all of a sudden. That feels good. I'll tell you, as a preacher, that feels so good because I know the Holy Spirit's convicting and converting and enlightening. But God may close the door on a job. Really, God may close the door on a job. And if he does that, he's going to open another door. Remember Elijah? Remember Elijah was out in the wilderness and he was provided food the birds brought his food every day. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine CNN, you know, interviewing Anderson Cooper, interviewing Elijah? Hey, how do you get your food out here? Look up, here it comes. <laughs> Can you imagine Anderson Cooper, you know, CNN? All right, anyway, fake news. But anyway, so I want you to think about this. By the way, there's a lot of fake news. It's just not one station and so forth. Uh, some news doesn't even deserve to be on the news channel. But at any rate, here's my point, is that in a skeptical age, can you imagine the mass media interviewing Elijah? And Elijah saying, yep, I've been out here for a long time, every day getting fed by these birds and drinking at the brook. But then the brook dried up. Oh, now what are you going to do, Mr. Elijah? Yeah, you hit a rough spot there, didn't you? God closed the door and led him to a widow who would take care of him there. In other words, God closed the door and he opened another door. And then God closed the door on Elijah's ministry on earth. 
and he opened the door of heaven, and that's where he is to this day. Are you just a little jealous? It's like, why can't they be me? How many would rather be you up there instead of Elijah? <laughs> and so the point is, God is in the business. L look at the Bible stories. God is in the business. Open door, closed door. Open door, closed door. Don't try to force a door open that God has shut. Amen? Let God lead. Let God lead. Have enough sense. Don't be butting your head against the closed door. Just say, Lord, I'm not going to force an issue. Learn to recognize God's providence because God speaks to us through his providential leading. It's absolutely amazing to me. All right. I'm going to tell you a little story. I'm going to make sure because this is new. And so, okay, Lord, is this you? <laughs> About five weeks ago, I had a tooth extracted. No major complications. Then here, about a week ago, I noticed some type of sharp protrusion coming up. And I'm like, what in the world is that? In the area where that tooth was pulled, and I'm thinking to myself, my dentist is back in Dallas-Fort Worth, and I get this protrusion, and it seems to be getting worse. And so fear, fear um, um, ignorance breeds fear. So I'm like, what in the world is that? And it's getting worse, and things are bothering me back there and so forth. And so I'm thinking, you know, because we conclude the series tomorrow night, and I wanted to go spend time with my dad in the assisted care facility. I want to go see my mom. And we were scheduled to leave on Tuesday. And I'm thinking, wow, I wanted to stay longer because I was thinking I'm going to stay with my dad until at least Friday, make sure that he's being taken care of and so forth with his dementia and so forth. And so I thought, okay, Lord, I got to go home to my dentist to get this thing taken care of. But Lord, if somehow you can just take care of it, that would be a sign that I can stay longer with my dad. Because recently, I was just, I just found out just a few days ago that my dad's weight went from, my dad's a retired pastor, I told you that, he's almost 89. Anyway, um, my dad's weight, they told me, went from 154 to 141 in 30 days. And so now they're bringing him in hospice. So, what's on my mind? <laughs> and so I'm like, Lord, I need a sign. I want to spend more time with my dad before, but I, I got this thing going on here, and I don't understand it, and it seems to be getting worse. And, and so my wife made an appointment on Wednesday for, you know, because we were going to fly back on Tuesday, and then on Wednesday she scheduled an appointment with the dentist, and I'm thinking, but I want to stay longer, Lord. Give me a sign. And so last night, I was just, you know, busy myself, greeting you all and so forth. And, uh, you know, I'm talking with the different people. And then all of a sudden, I end up looking at Dr. Jean Kim here. And I'm, wait a minute. He's a dentist. Help. <laughs> I went to his office today and he took care of it. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> That was unscripted, Doc, forgive me. But my point is, is that this is what God does every day. Well, not every day do I go to a dentist. But anyway, my point is, every day, if we're thinking God is opening and closing doors, and we're just trying to sense God's leading. And um, so I, I, I praise God. Thank you again, Dr. Kim, for accommodating this helpless pastor. But, you know, the thing is this, is that God wants to lead us every single day. He wants to lead us. God, listen to me, God is in the details. Is that true? Because, you know, what's interesting is when I saw my dad, you know, on last, I don't know, what was it, Monday or whatever, when I saw him, pardon me, Tuesday, the day we had off, I was leaving because I've been observing him, his eating. He's not eating very well, okay? He's just very slow and so forth. His walk is pretty good. He has a good balance, a good stride and so forth. But his mealtime is a little more um, 
problematic. And so I'm like, I'm trying to figure out how to, what I can do to help and talking to the people that work there and so forth. And they, uh, anyway, I had to talk to someone, one of the superiors there, about his diet and about what he was eating and to make sure that they were giving him things that were healthy and that he could chew and so forth. So I ended up talking to Candace. And uh, she is the, um, one of the superiors there. She's the one that oversees uh, the diet and so forth and, uh, you know, the food and so forth. And so I ended up going to her office and in talking with her, she went and got the file. And that's when she reported he's gone from 154 to 141. I wouldn't have known. So I would have been thinking in my mind, okay, my dad's going through a tough time, but no, 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 no. By me knowing this information, we know that it's now hospice time. So my heart is breaking inside, but I'm also thanking the Lord that I now know. I now can, can, can okay, so I know in my schedule and so forth, I'm going to be making trips more to Portland and so forth, because it's my firm belief that we must do all we can on our part to honor our parents until the day they die. I am a firm believer in that. I would think about Jesus. When Jesus was on the cross, talk about Jesus' voice. He said to John, behold your mother. It's not his mother. Oh, it is now. Mother, behold John. In other words, in Jesus' dying legacy, he told John, take care of my aging mother. Jesus Christ is the same today. Amen? Amen. So take care of your parents, your grandparents, and so forth. Okay, so that was just an add-in. But you know, that's Jesus speaking to us. My point is this, God is very personal. Hey, let me tell you something. God's in your family details. He cares about your family details. Amen? Amen. Trust in him. Let's read this together. Trust in him with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your paths, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So God will lead if we let him and cooperate with him in every decision we make. Every decision. Number five, God speaks to us through the preaching of his word. When a minister, a preacher, an evangelist, a Bible teacher, a lay preacher allows the Holy Spirit to control them, God speaks through them with power. A matter of fact, in Romans 10, 14 and 15, we read, And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So the preaching of the word of God is very important to God. This is very, very important. So listen, I will tell you this. You might have your favorite preachers, or your favorite evangelists, your favorite, but you know something? We must be ready to hear whoever God is speaking to us. God raises up evangelists, raises up pastors, raises up Bible teachers, and we got to make sure that we're really listening. Amen? At the age of 20, God gave me this verse. He gave me this call. This is my call to preach that God gave me at the age of 20 when I was in my 1966 satellite convertible traveling from my first love place in California and I was heading into Nevada and I would be heading up to Chicago and I'm crying and I take my Bible and I'm wondering what about the future? Oh Lord, please, please don't let me backslide. Lord, keep me close to you. And I open up my Bible And I read, therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, then I will bring you back. You shall stand before me. If you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as my mouth. I knew that God was telling this ninth grade dropout, I'm going to speak through you. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I just had this pact with Jesus. I had this agreement with the Lord. Lord, If you want me to preach, you need to lead people to ask me. They need to come to me and they need to tell me that they want me to come and preach at their church. And that's exactly what happened. God 
uses us if we're available. How many want to be available for God to use you to speak through your mouth? Number six, God speaks to us through nature. Jesus would spend time out in nature praying and studying and preaching. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Psalms 19, 1 to 4. After God created the world in six days, he rested on the seventh day. Then in the Ten Commandments, God said, remember the Sabbath day, and keep it holy. When did God give the Sabbath? Right there in the Garden of Eden. Amidst the beauties of nature, God gave the Sabbath. The Sabbath is all about taking time to listen to God. How much better to combine nature and the Sabbath. One of the best things to do on Sabbath afternoon is head to the hills. You got a few of them around here. Go to the mountains. Go, go for a hike. Go for hiking. And I uh, wish I could go with you. But anyway, the seventh day is a Sabbath is a perfect time after going to church in the morning to go out in nature, spend time contemplating God's love and power in creation. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, and that is he's Lord of the Sabbath. Amen? Absolutely beautiful. Mark 2, 27 and 28. Number seven, God speaks to us through even family members. Whoa. Now that's, that's a little tricky business because family members you know their flaws, you know their defects, you know each other's dispositions and weaknesses and so forth, and God can speak through family members that are faulty to you. God doesn't just speak through, let me just make this abundantly clear. Be careful of your relationship with your family members. Be careful because God may be speaking to you through them some advice, some counsel, some admonition, some comfort, some correction. And it's, it, you know, if you're not careful, you might put up barriers and be proud because you don't want to be corrected by your spouse. If there's one thing I know, <laughs> I've been married almost 35 years, I've learned, be humble enough to receive your wife's advice. They have this saying, happy life, happy wife, happy life. That might seem to be a trite saying, but I've discovered it's actually true. <laughs> so my point is this, is that we need to be open to our spouse's admonishing or counsel or encouragement and be open to our parents, be open to our children. Children, listen, what I've learned also, Jordan has come up with some very powerful insights at times. And same with our Caleb. And I, many, many times, God has spoken through them to me. And you know what I discovered about children? They also are willing to give advice. <laughs> and so you got dad, mom, I'm speaking to myself. You got to be humble there. There might be some good counsel. But it works both ways, children. And all the parents said, amen. Come on, give a little bit there. Yeah, you know, the point is this, is that we need to listen because God is speaking to us in many different ways. Yes, God can speak to you through your parents, your family, your friends, your loved ones, and yes, even strangers, even strangers at times. But we must make sure that it is always in harmony with God's word. Number eight, God speaks to us through dreams. That's right. When Jacob was running away from home because he deceived his father Isaac, and betrayed his brother Esau, alone and feeling forsaken by God as he lay on the cold ground with a rock for a pillow, he received a very impressive dream of a ladder, a celestial ladder comprised of holy angels stretching from where he was sleeping, where he felt rejected, he felt alone. No, the angels were coming from where he was sleeping all the way to heaven above, and God spoke to him, reassuring him that he was not forsaken. Can you imagine how that dream converted him and comforted him and would be with him for his life? God can give you a dream. God can give many dreams, and often it's comfort and often it's warnings. And so God told him, behold, I'm with you, 
and will keep you wherever you go, Genesis 28 and verse 15. Can you imagine what an impressive dream this was? And the Bible is full of dreams. When Jesus was just a baby, God gave Joseph a dream of warning to flee with his wife Mary and baby Jesus to Egypt because of the cruel persecution of King Herod. And we think about that at this time of year. And so, number nine, God speaks to us through rock music. You know where I stand on this. God speaks to us through sacred music. I praise God that here in this church you have good sacred music. Now I want to say a little something. Don't believe the lie that adults should have one kind of music and the youth should have a totally different kind of music. Don't believe it. It's a lie. Because often that's divided churches. Well, those adults, they get into the hymns and different things, and us young people, we like to have a little bit of rock and roll with our music. Friends, the devil is dividing churches over music. And that shouldn't be the case. But you see this over and over and over and over again. So much so that in some churches they say, well, we'll have one worship service that is rock and roll, and then we'll have one with the choir. You see it. It's happening. It doesn't matter. In different denominations, this is happening. I believe that we have an example of sacred music in the Bible. When David played the harp, the evil spirit that was oppressing and possessing King Saul left, departed. Did you hear that? You just think about that. That's very significant. That demonic evil spirit left when David was playing and singing some kind of music that the demons hated it so bad, they're like, we're out of here. This is very, very, very significant. There is a kind of music that attracts demons, and oh, it can even be with some Christian words in there, but there's a certain kind of music that is dark. I don't care how many good words you put with it, it's still a dark music. And then there's that kind of music that is so pure and is so sacred that it lifts depression and it gives inspiration and it gives a sense of the presence of God because God, up in heaven, there is constant praising God going on in heaven. Amen? Beautiful music in heaven. Our music down here should be similar to the music that is in heaven. Amen? Amen. So, I really feel strong about this because I went astray as a teenager and one of the number one reasons was because I was into rock music. That's why I feel so passionate about this because if you would ask, Mark, you were raised in a Christian home. I mean, give me a break. Your father's a pastor. Why did you go astray? Number one, rock music is the number one thing that led me to begin. See, because here's what happens. Music influences you. It creates feelings, and it creates thoughts. And the different thoughts and feelings that would come to me as I would listen to the Beatles. I remember, oh, I want to hold her hand. You remember, oh, that seems so innocent. And I would end up listening to stuff that's a lot darker than holding a hand. Remember that? The Beatles, Let It Be, and Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. Had nothing to do with heaven. <laughs> but I was so transfixed. I was so enslaved to music. It was who I was, that my identity was defined by my music I listened to. Well, that's the way it is with many people in these last days, especially young people. 
That's why it's so important that we help our young people to develop a taste of sacred, heavenly music. You know what? It's interesting. It's very interesting that... Go on Google. You've heard of Google. Go on Google and type in thinking music. Thinking music. And I bet you don't get rap. And I bet you don't get hip-hop. They're going to give you stuff like Beethoven, Mozart, the kind of music that I'd say like, yuck, that's horrible, boring stuff, until I became a Christian and I started listening to Bach. There is certain kinds of music that will actually empower your thinking process. Isn't that powerful? And how many have ever been in a store and, you know, you're in the store, you're just looking, and next thing you know, boom, 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 boom. You're like, what am I doing? <laughs> you're moving to the beat. Have you ever done that? You know, you didn't even know what you were doing. My point is, let the Lord speak to you through music. God speaks to us through sacred music. You listen to a violin solo, man, a violin is powerful. Have you ever noticed some of these big, I don't get into Hollywood movies, I guarantee you that, but some of these real epic movies, they bring in orchestra. Have you noticed that over and over? If you really want something epic, give them orchestra. And I say, amen. Rich, powerful. At this time, you know, Handel's Messiah and so forth, it's the Christmas season and so forth. There's just so much rich music that we can listen to. And maybe what I'll do is uh, tomorrow night or whatever, I'll actually share with you some of the different YouTube channels I like to go to with getting this guy. There's so much good music out there. The Bible says, Romans 12, 21, overcome evil with good. Amen? Overcome evil with good. So I cannot overestimate the importance of music. Throughout the biblical history of the children of Israel, God led them to learn spiritual songs to help them remember his tender love, his mercy, his power, his deliverance. They would sing. After the Red Sea, they began to sing praises to God. And so, yes, I believe God speaks to us through uplifting sacred music. Paul says that we should always be, quote, singing and making melody. Where, everybody? In our hearts. Ephesians 5, verse 19. Number 10, final point. God speaks to us through his judgments on earth. That's right. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Isaiah 26, verse 9. God allows earthquakes, famines, fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, and other natural disasters to speak to mankind of the great need of God and the fragileness and brevity of life. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Psalms 9, 19 and 20. God is on the throne, and as the ultimate judge, he speaks to the nations. Amen? God is speaking to us very loudly. Not in a little whisper. Very loudly. Through COVID-19. God is speaking to us. A mask you have on, or the mask you chose not to have on, either way, this COVID, God is speaking to us through signs of the times. These are wake-up calls where God is saying, it's time to repent of sin and be right with Him. I mean, Mount St. Helen is blowing its top off. God speaking to us. He allows these things to happen that he might get our attention. Soon it'll be forever too late, but it's not yet too late. So when you hear somebody say, well, you know, I don't, I don't even know if God exists. Open your eyes. What do you think is going on in this world? God is seeking to get our attention. 
Look all around us. Wars and rumors of wars, famines, climate change, tornadoes. We live in Tornado Alley. Did you know that there in Texas? Pray for us. Tornado Alley. But soon these, these Mount St. Helens and these different mountains, I believe very soon they're all going to blow up before Jesus comes. Now when Jesus comes, everything is going to shake. But I believe whole cities are going to be destroyed. God is seeking to get our attention. I could talk a lot about that, but in this series, you know, in this series, prophecy is all about things that are going on now, and God is seeking to get our attention. Amen? Amen. So finally, we want to have the mindset of the young boy Samuel in the Bible, who when he heard God speaking to him said, speak. For your servant, what everybody hears. We want to be like Elijah, who heard the still, small voice of God on the mountain. If it's your desire to listen to the voice of God, raise your hand. Now, something along the lines of... In 24 hours... We're done with the series. Many of you have made a decision to be baptized or to be rebaptized or to not be baptized but to join the church by profession of faith. If you have not already made that decision, what is Jesus saying to you? Search your heart. Lord, have you led me to this series of messages by Mark Fox? Lord, are you wanting me to follow this? Do you want me to be part of this church? I know. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know God will speak to you. He has spoken to you for the last month. For the last month, he's spoken to you. I want everybody to stand, and I'm going to close this in a certain way. Everybody stand. Nobody leave yet, please. And I want everybody to really be listening to the voice speaking to your heart. Ask God, God, what are you saying to me personally? If you want to be baptized, or rebaptize, whether it be tomorrow night or in the near future. I want you to just slip out of there and I want you to meet me down here. Right now, right now. If you're interested in baptism or rebaptism or joining the church by profession of faith, I want you to come down. You're interested in being baptized or rebaptized or come in by profession of faith. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Yes. Yes. Anybody else? Whether it's this Sabbath or in a month from now, or two months from now, you want to be baptized in the near future. Come now, if you want to be baptized, or rebaptized, or joined by profession of faith. Come. Come. Anybody else? Whether you're in the balcony, or wherever you are, you want to be baptized, or rebaptized in the near future. Amen. Isn't this beautiful? Amen. God's voice is speaking. Is there anybody else? that would like to join them and say, yes, I want to be baptized soon or rebaptized. Yes, just come down to the front. You want to be baptized or rebaptized? Or you say, Mark, I don't, I don't feel the need to be baptized, but I do feel that I've been led. Yes, God bless you. I believe, dear Lord, that you have led me to these meetings, and I want to be part of God's remnant church. I know there's others that need to make this decision. Look in your heart. Look in your heart. Is there one more person like to come forward and just a beautiful public testimony? I think about my friend Jaime here. Jaime. Jaime is, you're 25, aren't you? I met you. Come up here, Jaime. Come, come up here. <laughs> this is unscripted. Jaime. How, how, how often have you attended a Seventh-day Adventist church? Never. Is this your first night? Right. 
this first night? Jaime, you've been watching something for two years. What you been watching? Everything, pretty much. Yeah, and so what have you been watching on YouTube? Bible Flock Box, Doug Batchelor, and Mark Fox. He's been watching our channel, and Doug Batchelor, and Bible Flock Box. He texted me last night, and he said, I want to join the Yakima Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'd never met him before. He's been watching us online for two years. He lives in um, Toppenish. Did I say it right? Mm -hmm. Toppenish. And so Jaime Salinas, 26, 26 or 25? 25. 25 years old, taking a bold stand for Jesus, and we'll give you Bible studies. You know, we want people, we don't want to rush people. We want people to be able to get the Bible studies and get them ready for a, a near future baptism and so forth, and we look forward to that. And, but there's others here. I know there's others in this room that need to make decisions like Jaime and like, like Debbie and, 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 and others here and Amy and so forth. Praise God, Amy. And, and, and I just praise God for Price. Price has struggled over tobacco, but now he's been free for basically, what, six, six days? Pretty much six days, so forth. You should. And... Uh, if, if you want any gum, if you want any gum or candy, he's got tons of it. So you just, or if you have some, give it to him. He could always use more and so forth. But you know, God is working miracles. God is working miracles. I look at every one of you, and every one of you is a miracle. Some of you I don't, I haven't met, or I just met tonight, and, and you know, and that's fine. But I know there are many others that are even here tonight. You need to be up here. So is there anybody else that you've, God has led you to the meetings, but you're not yet a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but you sense this is the truth? The Bible says in Acts 2 that the Lord adds to the church. The Lord adds to the church. Is there somebody else that would like to come forward and say, yes, I do want to be part of God's end time church? I know there's some others. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We're not talking it has to be tomorrow, but you just sense that God led you to these meetings. There's voices. There's voices. There's voices in every one of our heads. Learn to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. Don't get on the wrong path of resisting the Holy Spirit. I know there are some here. I need to close, but I know... Others need to come forward. If you're listening to that right voice, I believe there's others who will come forward. Whether you listen to the voice of Jesus or not, I'm going to love you in the name of Jesus. But this evangelist, I'm listening to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is telling me there are others that need to come forward. But I'm not going to go on for an hour and so forth. Paul preached till midnight. I'm not going to do that. Is there anybody else that would like to say, Mark, in the near future, I want to be baptized or rebaptized, or I want to join by profession of faith? Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, God bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are there any other young people? Well, let's close with a word of prayer. I'll be up here afterwards if any more want to come forward. Uh, we love you in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know I've gone, actually this is the longest we've gone, but Lord, I just, you've put a burden on my heart that we would all make sure we're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Help us to make sure that our conscience is very tender and that we're really listening to you. Oh, Lord, you are so good to us. Bless all those who came forward and bless the baptism tomorrow night. I pray that everyone who came forward would just feel your peace. I pray that we would all feel your peace tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Can you praise the Lord tonight? Can you praise his name? God is good.